Lower back pain is an extremely common complaint, with 1 in 4 people reported to experience it every month, and around 80% of people will experience the condition at some point in their lives. The onset is often between the ages of 20 and 40, but the recurrent complaint of lower back pain is mostly between the ages of 40 and 80. Low back pain is divided into acute if it lasts less than 6 weeks, subacute if it lasts between 6 and 12 weeks, or chronic if it is above 12 weeks. In most instances, the pain will resolve within 6 weeks of onset. Low back pain itself is not a specific disease. It is a symptom which is caused by one of many underlying causes. These can be grossly divided into three main types. First is mechanical, which make up around 97% of cases. This is defined as back pain that is triggered by movement and decreases with rest. The most common cause is a lumbar spine strain or sprain, making up around 70% of cases. A strain is a disruption of the muscle fibres, while a sprain is a stretch of one of the ligaments leading to damage of some fibres, but leaving the ligament overall intact. Degeneration of the discs or facets is next, and discogenic back pain worsens with flexion of the back and with coughing or sneezing, as this causes an increased pressure within the discs. In contrast, pain from the facets is most commonly seen with extension. Other mechanical causes include disc herniation, known as herniation of the nucleus pulposus, spinal stenosis, which may come from osteophyte formation or ligament hypertrophy, or another cause is spondylolysis. Compression fractures are also included here and can occur without trauma, for example, in cases of osteoporosis or underlying malignancy. Sacroiliitis and scoliosis are also possible mechanical causes. Leg pain is commonly associated with lower back pain. However, the leg pain may be due to nerve root involvement, at which point it may be called sciatica or lumbar radiculopathy. While in some other instances, the leg pain may be referred pain from other sources. The next category is referred lower back pain, which makes up around 2% of cases. These are causes that are not found in the spine itself, such as abdominal pathologies. These include aortic aneurysms, acute pancreatitis, renal colic or pyelonephritis, and shingles. In females, conditions like endometriosis or ovarian pathologies like cysts or malignancy should also be considered. The remaining 1% are systemic causes, including inflammatory spondyloarthropathy, which includes ankylosing spondylitis, and cirrhotic arthritis. Infections such as discitis, osteomyelitis, and abscesses are included here, as is malignancy, with the most common cancers involving bone being lung, breast, prostate, and thyroid malignancies. It is also important to note that in approximately 80% of cases, even after a thorough workup, a specific diagnosis for the cause of back pain in that particular patient is not found. For this reason, it is important to look for red flag symptoms, which are mostly taken from the history and physical exam. These can include saddle anesthesia, meaning loss of sensation in the region of the buttocks, perineum and inner thighs, features such as incontinence or acute urinary retention, any neurological deficits, and systemic features such as weight loss, fever, or night sweats. A history that includes malignancy is also a red flag, as well as features such as immunosuppression or intravenous drug use. These must also be considered as they may predispose to infection, and a history of osteoporosis must also be considered as that may lead to fractures. Trauma is another, including the presence of visible spinal injury. Overall, a suggestion of non-mechanical pain, such as waking up from sleep, 
or no improvement with rest should also be investigated. Some conditions that are especially important to recognize include Coda Equina syndrome, spinal cord compression, an abscess, or potentially lethal abdominal causes such as a ruptured aorta or acute pancreatitis. The physical exam includes inspection, looking for deformities or abnormal curvature which may suggest fractures or scoliosis, kyphosis or lordosis. Palpation to locate any focal points of tenderness as well as an assessment of movement. Asking the patient to move can also help with narrowing down the causes. This involves both active and passive range of motion testing. Pain on flexion that radiates to the leg may suggest disc herniation, while pain on extension may indicate facet involvement or be more indicative of spinal stenosis. If the patient is young and has a reduced range of motion, then ankylosing spondylitis may be more likely. There are also a number of provocative tests that may be done to help localize the cause, including for lumbar disc herniation, where a straight leg raise is when the patient is lying supine and then flexes from the hip. The test is considered positive if there is pain below 60 degrees of flexion. The femoral stretch is done with the patient prone and the knee flexed. If there is pain on extension of the leg, then it is also considered positive. The sacroiliac joint can also be assessed with provocative movements. If three or more are positive, then it is considered that the sacroiliac joint is the likely cause. These include the thigh thrust test, distraction test, Geinsland's test, pelvic compression, or Faber tests. The physical exam should also include a full neurological examination to look for any deficits, and also remember that anyone presenting with low back pain should also have their hips examined. Lab tests are not always needed, but may be useful when looking for non-mechanical causes. This may include a full blood count, C-reactive protein, and erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Imaging is also used, although it is not needed in most cases. Generally, it is reserved for patients with red flag symptoms or patients in whom conservative management for over six weeks has not improved the pain. This can include vertebral x-rays, which may be done to look for fractures. MRI is recommended if neurological compromise is present. And CT scans are mostly done as part of a workup if trauma is involved. In general, the treatment depends on the underlying condition, so can vary greatly. If acute or subacute back pain from a mechanical cause is suspected, then patient reassurance and encouragement of normal activity as soon as is possible is suggested, along with heating devices to help relieve pain and reduce stiffness. Other options that may be suggested include massage, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, or physiotherapy, with most showing a benefit for pain, but not so much for function. If medication is ultimately required, then non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are considered first line, followed by paracetamol, and ultimately opioids if necessary. Muscle relaxants such as benzodiazepines may then also be added. If the mechanical back pain persists beyond 12 weeks and is chronic, some of the same steps are considered, but a particular emphasis is placed on exercise and physiotherapy. Pharmacotherapy is once again second line, and third line may include radiofrequency neurotomy or ablation, injection therapy, or ultimately surgery.